Okay, my name is Kristen O'Hara. I'm the Director of Interpretation at Pajarito Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, as we refer to it. We are located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. I will be the moderator for tonight's talk. PEAK is, of course, a nonprofit that operates the Los Alamos Nature Center, which is open 10 to 4, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays. Come on by and visit us. Also, visit our website for more awesome programs like this one that you're going to see tonight. We are, of course, able to offer programming at this time because of our wonderful members and donors. So I'd like to give a special shout out to you for your generous support. Thank you so much. To learn more details about becoming a member or donor, please visit peecnature.org, peaknature.org, or grab a membership brochure if you're in person at our docent desk. Okay, so next slide, please, Sarah. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so just a few logistics before we get started for the Zoom folks and for the in-person folks. The presenters this evening will be taking questions on Zoom via Zoom chat. And for in-person, we will have a microphone available for you at the end of the talk. To find the chat icon on Zoom, please look at the Zoom app menu bar, which will be on the bottom or the top of your screen. And go ahead and tap, type your questions into that chat box. Um, if you don't see that bar, click on the three dots, which is more, and then you will find it in the more section. To change your view of this Zoom presentation, please click on the view icon in the upper right hand corner of your screen, and you'll have several options for your viewing pleasure. After this talk, you'll receive a short evaluation. Please take a moment to fill, to fill out that evaluation. Your input helps us improve future programs. In particular, you, if you have any questions that we are unable to get to this evening, please let us know on that evaluation form. Okay, a bit about tonight's presenters. Mark Payton is a National Park Service wildlife biologist in the Valles Caldera National Preserve. His wildlife interests include threatened and endangered species, conservation and carnivore biology and resource use. He has worked with the mountain lion, with mountain lions, black bears, mule deer and elk in the large mammal monitoring project since the project began in 2011. Sarah Milligan is the natural resource program manager at Bendelaire National Monument. She started her MPS career as a firefighter at Lassen Volcanic National Park. Then she worked at the fee program at Acadia National Park before moving to Bendelaire. Sarah graduated from the Oregon State University with a master's in wildlife management. She has worked on many projects at Vandalier, including the reintroduction of native trout and beavers. And then last but not least, a very special shout out to Dr. James Kame, from who will not be presenting this evening, but is the researcher in charge of the Large Mammal Monitoring Project. Dr. Kane is the assistant unit leader of the USGS New Mexico Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, an affiliate professor in fish, wildlife, and conservation ecology at NMSU. Dr. Kane is a principal investigator for the Large Mammal Monitoring Project in the Hemis Mountains. Awesome. So I'm going to hand it over to Mark and Sarah, and uh, they'll uh, tell us a lot of things. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy. Thank you very much for the introduction. And hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening for this encore presentation. Mountain lion ecology is part of the Large Mammal Monitoring Project. So wanted to start us off. This is a young adult female mountain lion. We radio collared. I particularly like this photo because it shows the thinning effects. So she recently had moved into that area. And it kind of shows the interactions that we're looking for and trying to capture on this project. Today, we're going to talk about a brief introduction of the Large Mammal Monitoring Project and what it is. And then we're going to just skip the other species and move right into mountain lions. We've got a lot to cover, so I'll just give a very brief introduction to the Large Mammal Project. Um, there will be other opportunities to let you know what that part of the project is. Um, I'm going to try to get Dr. James Kane here at PEAK to give a presentation 
we talked about it this last weekend. So that would be a really neat opportunity for everybody to chime in and see what that is. Capture handling, probably just gonna briefly touch on this. What I really wanna talk about today is more the movements and habitat, predation and interaction with other species. And then I'm gonna hand it off to Sarah, who's going to talk about the reproduction and den site selection and then close it out with the collaboration, education, and outreach. So that's just kind of a brief overview of what you can expect. For those of you not as familiar with the Hamas Mountains, uh, this map here shows the administrative boundaries of what we're looking at with the Large Mammal Project. So it encompasses both National Park Service units, the Valles Caldera and Bandelier National Monument, and then extends down to the southwest part of the Hamas Mountains in the Santa Fe National Forest surrounding the community of Hamas Springs. Project ranges from high elevation, mixed conifer, montane grassland, down at the lower elevations, getting more into the pinyon juniper and canyon land environment. So how did this all come about? Basically, a bunch of people got together, identified that high intensity, high severity wildfires were a great risk in the Hamas Mountains, pulled their resources together and came up with a project to reduce hazardous fuels and recover from wildfire. And so the goal of the overall project is to improve the resilience of the ecosystems to recover from wildfires and other natural disturbance events, and really to sustain those healthy forests moving forward from here. So this photo here is the 2013 Thompson Ridge fire. So this is kind of the umbrella on which all of the other large mammal project and the mountain lion ecology project function under. So the question came about, we're creating all of this, you know, restored forests, recovering from wildfire events. What does that do to the large mammals on the environment and the ecosystem? And this has not really been looked at in a cohesive holistic view before. And so the large mammal project was to look at mule deer, elk, black bear, and mountain lion simultaneously, along with a lot of vegetation work, and then really look at what the animal movements and habitat selection do. And so this paired photo here is a fun little response that I noticed and just kind of an anecdotal, what do mountain lions do with thin forests? In the top photo, you can see hand crew going through, cutting with chainsaws, thinning the forest, on the very same day, just about six, seven hours later, mountain lion walks through on the same trail that it was using beforehand. So even with all of that disturbance, with the changed forest and everything else, that mountain lion used the environment the exact same way he had been using it. And the reason I had this camera in this location was because I had known he was using that spot. So it was really neat just to see that his behavior didn't change with that disturbance that thinning crew was probably still working that late into the evening. So pretty fun there too. Give you a brief timeline of where we're at in the process. The administrative part of the project really began in 2010 with the idea of implementing starting in 2011. However, everybody around this area knows 2011, lost conscious fire hit, high intensity fire, kind of delayed everybody's plans. Really in 2012 is when most of the work got going for the project. And then in 2013, the project again had another large fire, the Thompson Ridge fire hit. In 2015, the Valles Caldera became a member of the National Park Service. So this kind of changed some of the functions in which we operated under. Um, and then also allowed us to kind of expand the scope, change some of the resources that were available to us. And then in 2020, we were able to expand the large mammal project out to include Bandelier National Monument, um, which was a great partnership that we weren't really able to do previously to that National Park Service. So all of that is just to get us to this point, really. Where we're at right now is implementation monitoring. So. The main thing I want to communicate is this is very much an active project. We're still collecting data. Um, we're still working in the field. 
all the results, all the information we're sharing with you is still preliminary. And you can expect to see additional updates and more information coming from this project over the next few years. Uh, with all of the project completion slated to end at 2025 with additional publications. And technology doesn't like me very much and the screen just went away, but we'll work on that. Thank you very much. So here's where we are right now with project totals, excluding the mountain lions, which we're just about to get into. So bear with me a few more minutes. Um, 154 adult female elk, 31 elk calves, 120 black bears, 55 adult female mule deer, also installed 113 long-term vegetation plots and installed 145 remote cameras to look at species occupancy across the range. So what I want you to really take home from this is, this is a very big project with a lot going on, a lot of species interactions, a lot of interactions with the ecosystem. The results from what we have so far, you can find on the USGS Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Units page. So this is a screenshot of the website. You can do a search for this. Um, there are eight peer reviewed publications. We've had seven graduate students so far graduate from the project. There are three graduate students currently working on the project. And then a variety of presentations and agency publications so if you go to this site, you can actually download the peer reviewed publications if those are of interest to you. All right, the main reason we're all here tonight. So my favorite part of the large mammal project, discuss mountain lions. Capture and handling of the adults. So we have 37 mountain lions right now on the project. 11 adults are currently radio collared and five cubs are collared. One thing of note, the females have been weighing significantly less than the adult males. Um, not everybody realizes how much of a weight discrepancy there can often be between those two. So right now, 85 to 110 pounds, 110 pounds is a very big female mountain lion. The males, 110 to 160 pounds is what we're seeing. And again, for down here in the Southwest, 160 pounds is a very large adult male. Um, as you move further north, they can get significantly heavier. Um, most of our male mountain lions have been right around the 130 to 140 pound range. I did want to take a minute to discuss the safety and ethics involved with captures and handling of large carnivores specifically, um, but with all the work that we do. So we do work very hard to ensure that all of the animals are captured as safely as possible. Um, and we try to treat them all as respectfully as we possibly can. And for all of our capture methods, they've been reviewed by two different animal care and use committees. And that we do have veterinary oversight for everything that we do. And the way I've been designing the traps and setting the traps um, is really to minimize any potential bycatch to maximize the efficiency so I can respond to the trap as soon as possible and the animal does not stay in the trap for any longer than absolutely necessary. So everything has a cell phone camera and a GPS trap transmitter affixed to it. And I'm able to respond and get to the sites within about two hours um, would be the longest anything would be in the site. Um, so we do take this very seriously and I did wanna spend a moment to mention it. Once we've trapped the mountain lion, we're looking at the age based on tooth and gum wear. And as you can see, the one to one and a half year old mountain lion photo up there, the teeth are very white, very sharp. Uh, when we measure the teeth, a lot of times at that age, the canines have not fully grown in yet. Um, so we can actually see kind of the age based on that. As they get older towards that three and four year time frame you start to get some yellow staining on there, a little bit of the gum wear. And then for us and most places, a 10 year old mountain lion is a very old mountain lion. Uh, we don't get very many that survive to that age, but if they do survive to that age, you can start to see the canines are pretty much completely worn down. 
um, very yellow, very stained. And in a lot of cases, the incisors are worn down to gum line or missing completely. Um, so we're not getting a very exact specific age, but we are getting a very close estimate for each of the individuals that we're capturing. And then this is just kind of a fun thing. Whenever I do have someone out with me on a, a trap capture, I try to show them this because not a lot of people get to look at, you know, mountain lions and mountain lions, mouths and tongues and everything like that. So this is just kind of a fun little thing. So just like house cats, they have an incredibly rough tongue and this helps support their behavior in a lot of different ways. Um, they groom consistently all the time cleaning themselves, um, making sure that their paws are clean and there's no snow or anything in between their toes. And then when they're feeding and drinking, this is really helpful as well, just to clean the hair off, clean muscle off, everything like that, and then assist with capturing water to move to the mouth. So just kind of a fun little side thing there. Whenever we capture a mountain lion, we stay on site for the entire capture process, including reversing it after we've given it the chemical immobilization. We stay there to make sure that everything looks good with the animal, that there's not increased vulnerability or anything like that, and to make sure that it gets up and moves away from the site um, safely. And so this is an individual, M19, he was a young male. We stayed on site and I'll show you here real quick. This is what we look for after the capture. Hi. Hello. As you can see, it just gets its bearings, looks around, and then gets up and moves off. So both of the radio collars in there, one's a GPS radio collar and the other is a backup VHF collar. So we make sure those look well fitted, that the animal can move its neck all the way around, not encumbering it in any way, and then make sure that it's using all of its legs as, as it walks off and that there's no injuries or anything else. And so that's exactly what we're looking for. That mountain lion from that spot went on to be monitored for another two and a half years, um, behaved really well, was in good health and everything else. And then we do often get questions about how much the radio collars weigh, how large they are. Um, so the GPS radio collars, which are the larger radio collars, weigh about one and a quarter pounds. Um, for a hundred pound animal, that's not an issue at all. From the radio collar data that we've been collecting, we were able to collaborate with New Mexico Department of Game and Fish and Santa Ana Pueblo to create a population density estimate for the entire mountain range. Uh, another question that we regularly get is how many mountain lions are there? And this can be an incredibly difficult question to answer. Um, what we did was combine overlapping the radio collar data along with photo grids throughout the entire mountain range. Um, and we're able to do a spatial capture recapture model. Came up with a density of 1.1 mountain lions per 100 square kilometers. So that's a pretty low density, but this is an animal that survives at low density across most of its range. These results have gone on to assist New Mexico Department of Game and Fish with their management, as well as helping us further understand the ecology of the species in the mountain range. So I'll show you a little bit here why this can be so tricky. Adult male M8, was probably the largest total range for any of the males we were monitoring. And you can see a 372 square mile home range. He just, he covered both national parks plus a significant portion of the Santa Fe National Forest just by himself. His range was enormous, but he did not use the entire range evenly. So creating a hotspot analysis, which you can see just kind of here with the density all the red and yellow are the higher density areas that he liked to use, but periodically he would roam elsewhere throughout his range. Um, you know, just like humans do, we have spots that we spend more of our time, but then every once in a while we'll roam out and go somewhere else. Um, he did the same thing. And so it's very difficult to capture the total number of individuals when they use a landscape 
so intermittently, and then some spots in their range will look so busy. We monitored this male for about five years, and it was, you can tell from these photos, it was a hard five years. I mentioned earlier, we don't get a lot of individuals that survive to that 10 year range. And that's because of a lot of internal competition between mountain lions, but also hunt pressure um, on the Santa Fe National Forest as well. So these are a legally hunted animal on the Santa Fe, not on either of the National Park Service units. But as you can see here, from five years old, his face, good coloration, no scars, no real any problems. By the time he was 10, he had been in several different competitions with other individuals for that territory. Um, so yeah, it is a, a, a tough life for mountain lions out here, particularly the males sometimes. So just to give you an example of what our female ranges look like here in the Jemez Mountains, F6 had a pretty large, but not too abnormal home range for a female mountain lion. Her range, 132 square miles, you know, just a little bit larger um, than some of the other females, but, you know, right in that ballpark of what you would expect for the entire Valles Caldera. So for a lot of us, we look out there on that landscape of the Valles Caldera, and it looks just enormous, this big, huge landscape. For a mountain lion that requires so many resources, um, you know, that only makes up a portion of its total range and the re total resources that it needs to survive. In addition to monitoring the lions that are staying within the mountain range, we've also had a disperser. This was a young male that we captured in Bandelier National Monument, um, not terribly far from the visitor center there. Uh, he stuck around within the area for a couple of months, trying to kind of see what the range was going to look like, spending some intermittent time probably with his mother, because he was a young sub-adult at that point and probably not completely independent. When he reached just under two years old, he dispersed from our mountain range and cruised right on up, didn't seem to have too many issues at all, reaching Southern Colorado. So, right outside of Durango, found his new range, set up some territory, and has been sent, spending his time up in there. So it's really neat to see that we're not an independent landscape. We are a connected landscape to the areas around us. And one of the things I think mountain lion movements really show us and tell us is the importance of cross-boundary collaboration and kind of this landscape approach to conservation. All of our efforts in each of these different land agencies and different land ownerships all contribute to the range, but none of us are separate or independent from each other. Um, currently with this project, we're working with over 250,000 hours of movement data. So you can imagine there's a lot more analysis to do. There's a lot more that we're going to get out of this. We have a question in the room. By all means. Yeah, so the question for those um, virtually, the question in the room was, what is that bird on the screen right now? And that is a golden eagle. So we do get quite a few golden eagles on our sites. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it here in just a minute. But this was a motion camera set up on a kill site. And a golden eagle came in and scavenged and took advantage of that. So they are beautiful, beautiful birds. I agree completely. One more question from the room. So if, um, if a mountain lion is pregnant, does that mean she will not hang around the previous subadults? The previous subadults are definitely gone, or could she still be hanging around with older subadults while being pregnant? So the question again was, if a female becomes pregnant, will she spend time with the previous subadults, or will she separate herself basically from those subadults? And generally, what we've been finding is, as the subadults get to about 15 months of age, the female will re-enter estrus, and a male will come and push last year's yearlings off of that female, and kind of run them away when he breeds with the female. Um, and that helps encourage the subadult dispersal from the area. And then the female 
the gestation period is 90 days approximately. So the female in a few months after that will then have the next litter of cubs. And those subadults have moved on by that point. There will be some potential overlap with female subadults. Sometimes they don't disperse as far, and so you get ranges similar. Um, but generally speaking, they'll be completely independent moving into that two year time frame. I think for those in the room, we're going to try to hold the questions um, till the end of the presentation, um, just because it's really difficult for the virtual audience. So thank you. In addition to looking at just kind of this big geospatial level movement, um, we're very interested in kind of narrowing down a little bit and looking at what they're doing on the ground for this project. So uh, some of the basic, basic questions we're looking at with habitat, are the mountain lions using forest treatments at all um, or are they just completely avoiding them? And then getting into this question of selection or avoidance. So are they using them proportionately to their availability on the landscape? So this is what a treated forest looks like in part of the Jemez Mountains. Um, open ponderosa pine stand, nice grass understory. And then, yes, anecdotally, what we are seeing right now is mountain lions do use thin and burned forests. So in this photo, very hard to tell, so that's why I put an arrow on there. That right there in the middle of the picture is an active mountain lion kill site. So there is an entire cow elk buried out there by a mountain lion with a female mountain lion somewhere very close by to that spot um, waiting to come back in and feed. So we are seeing and getting observations of them using these landscapes that have been treated. So this is really good news for us. Our next steps moving forward is to take that 250,000 plus hours of movement data. And in a couple of years, that'll be much higher and then start creating these resource selection function models. Um, and that will be kind of what we look to publish on as we get closer to the 2025 timeframe. Uh, but until then, we're going to continue collecting these visual observations and looking at how they're using the landscape. So the way we find these spots out there is by using what's called GPS clusters. So the GPS callers that the mountain lions wear send us data every 24 to 48 hours via the computer. They're taking data points every three hours is the way we have them set up right now. And we get the data on the computer, map it across the landscape, and we're looking for these clusters of data points. Mountain lions very rarely spend much time in one spot unless there's a feeding site or some other site of interest breeding, den site, bed sites, things like that. And so once we receive the data, we try to go out into the field as quickly as possible and investigate what's going on out there. And just a brief note, because we're not getting a cluster of data until it's six hours or more time, this does slightly bias our results towards larger prey items. So we do just want to acknowledge that we're missing some of the rabbits and squirrels and other small things that you might see if you were to try to use another method. However, this is the most common method for predation visits and site visits. So for our landscape here in the Hamas Mountains, uh, what we've been seeing so far on this project is that elk and mule deer by far dominate the diet of mountain lions on the project. Um, not even really a comparison. We find some other small stuff, but not much. Uh, really, mule deer and elk are making up the vast, vast majority of what we've been able to find so far. Um, and comparing this to some other projects, this isn't too unexpected um, for a high elevation ecosystem. If you were to compare this to a lower elevation riparian ecosystem, um, they are finding a slightly different prey base, um, but similar site areas as what we have, have similar results as to this. Um, so it is kind of interesting to see it, um, but it's not terribly unexpected. I did want to mention briefly another 
collaborative project that we've just started. This hasn't been fully developed yet, so this is kind of a sneak peek of what we're looking to do. Um, but we're looking to identify prey selection on, based on stable isotopes by plucking or clipping a whisker during capture from the mountain lions. What we're going to do right now is create a prey library, library sorry, um, of all the different prey sources that are in our landscape. Um, once we've developed that library, it'll make fu future comparisons very easy for us. We're going to validate the results of what we're seeing from the whisker stable isotopes to the GPS cluster data that we've been collecting. That'll give us visual on the ground observations to make sure that the method is working. Um, so this has been tried with other species before. To my knowledge, it has not been done with mountain lions. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. We've tested this now with 10 lions. Um, it looks like it's going to be working. So I'm really excited to expand this out um, and get more data to validate this. Um, but yeah, great collaboration started up with UNM Center for Stable Isotopes. So stay tuned for more information on this one. It'll be fun. So once a mountain lion makes a kill, we just talked about, you know, mule deer and elk are the primary prey sources. So what does a mountain lion do at that site? And this is really interesting to get some of the site specific behavior and information. And one of the things that mountain lions try to do is reduce any prey detection. They don't want their kill stolen by anything. They would try to prefer, you know, to reduce scavenging and loss of that kill site. And so they really do try to often hide the kill as best as they can. So this little video, about a 90 to 100 pound female lion just takes some mule deer and wanders off into the woods with it. Um, we see this all the time, you know, even with elk, 400, 500 pounds, um, these mountain lions are capable of dragging them off to a secluded hidden area um, to reduce the amount of disturbance and detection. It's really impressive to watch. Once they've dragged it into a spot where they feel comfortable, they cover their prey, which is a behavior that we refer to as caching. Um, they take the pine needles and any loose debris or anything and scrape it up over the top to create a pile like we saw um, there in that thinned and burned forest. And so I wanted to take a moment to just let this youngster show us how to do it. So six month old cub behavior that is going to help support it for the rest of its life. And it's already, you know, either learned or instinctual. I can't answer that question, um, but it's already showing that behavior, um, which we expect from all of the adults and everything else. So I think it's going to be a successful adult, hopefully. Here's what a cache looks like. So it's just a big pile of leaf litter and debris. There's an entire cow elk in there. Um, so it's completely covered and everything else. Um, creates it to where birds and other scavengers won't alert on it and tell every other animal in the woods that it's out there. And then the other behavior that mountain lions um, often exhibit is they sit very close to the kill site. So moving this arrow over, this female is just sitting there um, in the juniper tree, watching the entire situation. So I mentioned before the GPS cluster data is two or more points. It's within 150 meters. So it's points right next to each other. So oftentimes when the mountain lions make a kill, they're not too far away. Um, they'll move off to a bed site sometimes. They'll move off to somewhere that they're comfortable, but there's a lot of coming and going from that kill site not only to protect the kill from other scavengers, but also just to have multiple feeding bouts. You can imagine, you know, a 300 pound animal, which is the kill deer or elk is going to feed a mountain lion for 10 days. Sometimes if it doesn't get too hot or too scavenged by other animals. So a mountain lion can't eat all of that right away. And so it needs to protect it. And then it just comes back and forth to the kill over time. 
So even though mountain lions try as best they can to protect their kills, other scavengers do find them. So this is one of the huge ecological advantages that mountain lions provide to the environment is they feed a lot of other animals out there. Um, this video is a female mountain lion sitting on her mule deer buck. So beautiful female, if you look at the date and time on that, so that's December 14th. So show you here, that mule deer buck sitting on that site continued to provide food for other animals all the way into March. So we see scavengers showing up for a few months sometimes, particularly in winter. So here we have some of what you would expect to see as scavengers on a kill site the bobcat and the coyote, regular visitors. But we also get some animals that aren't as expected. So we get small songbirds like you see in that bottom corner picture. Um, so, so far we've already detected 28 bird species and 20 mammal species showing up at these kill sites. And we have two scientists in the park staff right now, Shelly and Lexi that are going through and cataloging photos for us. So we may see that number of vertebrate scavengers increase over time as we make it through more of our images and videos. But it's a really neat environmental kind of response that we see. And there's some interesting literature out there um, if anybody's interested. So as I was saying, it's a really important resource for animals we do see a lot of competition at these sites. Um, black bears are the dominant individuals on this landscape. So the black bears will regularly practice kleptoparasitism, which is just basically coming in and stealing the food source away from mountain lions. And we've seen it where even sub-adult black bears will steal a full adult mountain lion's kill. Don't know if that happened to anybody else, but technology again, blacked out. All right, we're back. Thank you. So black bears being the dominant, we, we also see coyotes at about 50% of the kill sites. Coyotes will frequently harass, um, just kind of staying on the periphery, trying to stay out of the way, but also yipping and barking, carrying on. And then as soon as there's an opportunity, they'll sneak in and scavenge some of the food. Um, so they're always around for us on this landscape. We also see this with our other mountain lions. So mountain lions will sometimes share, alternate feeding of a carcass. Um, we've seen this on a number of occasions where males and females in particular will rotate feeding, um, just coming in for a few hours at a time and then moving out to a bed site. But other times, like this photo that I picked, the dominant individual will sometimes just come in and take the kill. Um, the mountain lion that's bedded down up there in the oak was not the individual that killed that, but he did come in and just push the female with her cubs off the kill and take it for himself. Um, so that is another kind of interaction of kleptoparasitism that we do see on this landscape. Competition is not just between mountain lions and other species. This is a fun little video. I don't know about you, but I feel bad for the bear. Uh, we can all imagine what just happened there. So by putting these cameras out on these sites, we're getting really interesting behavior and interactions that extend beyond just the mountain lion interactions. Um, and so this was a fun one that you know, not all the competition is based on size. Um, some other animals have other abilities, um, such as the skunks, and we've seen a lot of aggressive skunks on this landscape. Some competition will rise to the level of conflict. And so this was a very interesting site to explore and look at. So this was a site that was two different males got into a fight and the fight started uphill from where this photo was taken. 
they tumbled down the hill. It's a little hard to see, but there's an entire bear stripe down that hill of just dirt. Um, the two mountain lions got intertangled, tumbled down the hill together, ended up in the bottom of the wash, and there was blood located all over the bottom of the wash. And the fight continued down the drainage until it finally cleared up. And then the male mountain lion tracks went opposite directions at the end of the wash um, with a male mountain lion that was radio collared going up and bedding for three days on the opposite hill slope. And this is that male here. And you can see he's missing part of his ear. He's got scars all over his face. Um, so he got through that fight went bedded down after a few days he was back up running around the mountain just being a normal mountain lion so they can recover from amazing things and this is why you see those older males in particular that just look scarred up um, is through these conflict events we have documented four fatalities as a result of mountain lion to mountain lion conflict three of those fatalities have been females um, with only one of them being males, which was a little interesting to me and a little unexpected to me. Um, but does make sense when you think that females are significantly lighter weight um, than the males. And for us in this project area, humans are the leading cause of adult mountain lion mortality. Um, so even though there's no predator hunting on the NPS units, um, those mountain lions that use the park service are still subject to some level of hunt pressure outside. Um, but for cubs, male mountain lions are the leading cause of mortality. Um, so this is a sexual selection advantage um, as new males move into an area, kill the cubs, and then try to have their genetics move forward with a new litter of cubs. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah Milligan to talk to us about some cub confirmation. So give us just a moment to switch off the equipment. Okay, I think the microphone's on. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mark. That was awesome. Um, I get to talk about the fun stuff now, uh, the cubs. So we let's see let's switch side slides here. Let's actually start with um, frequently asked questions that we get about cubs. Um, so do mountain lions have a breeding season and what time of year are cubs born? Um, mountain lions can breed year round. Um, we typically see cubs born between June and September, but right now we have four females with cubs and we have, let's see, one cub is about 14 months old. Uh, one's about nine months old. We have a few that are eight and a half months old and some that are four and a half months old. So you can see they were born pretty much year round. Um, and that's just based on a lot of different factors that we won't go into tonight. Um, another question we, we get is, do we call them cubs or kittens? Um, you can call them either one. Um, they don't care, but <laughs> uh, we typically go with cubs um, because we consider mountain lions to be large cats. And just like an African lion, it's considered a cub versus your house cat, which would be a kitten. But I'll leave it up to you if you consider a mountain lion large or small. So, um, and a little picture in the corner there, sorry. Um, you can see that mountain lion cubs are spotted. If you didn't know that, they can look like bobcats when they're young. The spots fade as they grow. Um, so once they're full grown, they typically don't have the spots any longer. All right, so this is one of the little cubs we collared. She was about three weeks old. Um, so because, um, documenting cub survival rate is really difficult because you need to get down to the den. You have to find the den first, get down to the den, count the number of cubs, and then, um, track it pretty much through the first year, year and a half of its life. Um, so we've started collaring, uh, cubs last year was our first year doing that. We have five cubs collared right now four males and one female. Uh, we do call her between three and five weeks old. Right around four weeks, the cubs start, their claws and their uh, teeth start hardening. So, um, and then after five weeks, they're too fast for us to catch. Um, and it's just a mess out there trying to grab them. So, <laughs> 
Um, we use expandable radio collars that are custom made by American lion specialists. Um, so these, these collars expand as the cub grows and then eventually it'll fall off, usually right around nine months old. Um, so, all right, so the picture on the right, I'll get into now. So it sounds like fun, doesn't it? Playing with a little baby mountain lion cub because they're so adorable. It's actually the most terrifying thing I've ever done in my life. Um, <laughs> you have to go down into the den while the mother's off feeding. So it has to be timed right. And we really only have that window of the three to five weeks. Um, so typically takes multiple days of us trying to go in and making sure she's not there when we're going in. On the right, that's one of our... Uh, entrances to where the den was. We both had to take off our packs and kind of slide sideways through there. Um, yeah, the whole time I kept picturing her chasing us into that. So <laughs> she never did, luckily. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you think about um, a female mountain lion in her mind, it's, you know, it's her job. It's her only goal in life is to have cubs and raise them and, and um, keep them safe. So she's putting her dens in hard to reach areas. Um, hard to find places, small places, because they're cats, they can get into anything. Um, so getting into these dens is, is fun. <laughs> um, but we do take, just with that said, we do take a lot of safety precautions. Um, before we head in, we check her, her um, collar data, her GPS data, make sure she's off the kill or hopefully off the, off, sorry, off the den on a kill. Um, after Typically around three to five weeks, she needs to eat. So she's off killing something and eating. Um, and we never go in alone. Make sure there's always a couple of people there, at least, if not more. Um, we take the telemetry unit with us so we can track her collar if she's starting to come back. Um, let's see, we always discuss everything ahead of time, make sure we have all our equipment, um, Make sure we, everybody knows the entrance pass and then the exit pass. We definitely want to know the fastest way to get out of there if we have to. Um, and always carry a bear spray. And yeah, so if anybody is worried while we're down there, if anybody feels uncomfortable or unsafe, we, we, everybody just gets up and leaves. So um, we don't take any chances with, you know, a mom and her babies. So. All right, so here's a couple of den sites. Um, these are just from last year. You can see how hard they are to find, how visually obscure that one on the left is. Um, the one on the right, I remember crawling in on my belly because um, <laughs> I don't even know how the, the mother fit into that den site. But so to date, we've documented eight dens um, and every single den has had somewhere between one to three cubs in it. This is one other den that we documented in 2021. Um, you can see where the cub was. This is an interesting one because um, she just used the thinning treatment. So you can see, you can see where they cut the logs um, and you can tell that it's in the thinning area. So um, another just proof that the lions are using the thinned areas. All right, so this is one of the dens as well. I'll just play this for you. Oh, actually, I should say when we um, when we do go down to the dens, because we've had so many failed dens in the past, we're trying to figure out why they're failing. So we've been putting cameras up on the dens um, just to see if we can figure out why why cubs aren't surviving. Um, so we've been actually getting a lot of fun videos out of that. Um, let's play. That comes about five weeks old at that point. And um, as you can see, that's how mom moves them around. So, <laughs> and they don't really like it apparently. <laughs> that was a fun one to get. So um, this was another den. These cubs are about three weeks old um, and they're just terrorizing their mother for weeks and weeks, <laughs> but they're really cute. You can see the radio collars on their necks to the little expandable ones. And the one little guy has an ear tag. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So um, cubs typically stay in the den with mom until about three months. We're finding lately they've been leaving a little sooner, but uh, once they're about three months old, they they leave and travel with mom till they kills and everything. Um, play this video. So, and Mark mentioned it too, but cubs will typically stay with mom till about 18 months um, is a typical number. Um, while they're with mom, they're well-fed and kind of chubby sometimes, but when they leave, they, they have to figure out how to feed on their own, how to kill things on their own. So they can lose weight right at the beginning. So some of the younger uh, lions will be less, well, way less than, um, than the cubs even actually. And then once they figure it out, then they put that weight back on. Here's another um, another video we got at one of the kill sites. These cubs are about six uh, week or six months old. And then this is a fun video because you can see she's looking for her cubs um, and making noises that we don't typically think mountain lions make. But this is a communication call between a mother and cubs. Not typically what we'd expect from a big cat. <laughs> um, this one's a fun video. Uh, just mountain lions are, are just like us, just like kids. They brother and sister right there. <laughs> All right. So that's all the cub videos. Sorry about that. But um, if you want to see more, let us know. <laughs> um, so this project has allowed us to do a lot of education, a lot of outreach um, over the years, uh, multiple internships, lots of university classes coming out, uh, different professional training, special events, um, some scientific conferences. I think there's one coming up in April, actually, April 1st. Um, lots of social media. We're hoping to expand that even more soon. And the soon to be Him as Mountains Research Learning Center website, which I'll show on the next slide. Um, we're getting that up and running with, with a bunch of different partners. Um, so that top photo is just a group of people from the wildlife society, um, that came out to, to see a kill site and learn about how, how that works in the Jemez. Um, the one on the right is, um, a Los Alamos intern teaching some, um, um, up and coming professionals about uh, you know prey prey versus predator uh, relationships, and then the one on the the bottom left is is us at peak last year for the bear fest. <laughs> so, um, this is just an example of what we're working on for the Hamas Mountains Research Learning Center. Um, we are collaborating with a bunch of different organizations to uh, expand the research in the Hamas, and so this will be hopefully coming soon. Thank you to everybody. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you to Peak for hosting us. Um, thank you to all the people working on this project for the last few years. Okay, here's kind of an overview of the landscape restoration program. Lots of people involved. You can see the collaboration between just everybody. <laughs> um, next slide shows just some more participants in the actual land, large mammal monitoring project. Um, And then a lot of just individuals who have helped us on this project. Lots of people, and there's going to be lots more in the next few years. So I think with that, we're up for questions. If anybody has anything outside of this talk, if you want to email it, either one of us, we'll get, we can answer any questions for you. Um, and as the slide says, just be patient. We'll get back to you. We're just really busy. So. All right. I think Great. we can go to questions. Christine. So I'm going to ask if you have questions, please come back to either side of this desk and I'm going to hand you the microphone so we don't have to relay the questions back to the Zoom audience. 
just while everyone's coming up, they want to in the room to ask questions. I have several on Zoom and we'll start with this one, which is, um, have these colored mountain lions crossed the Rio Grande? And I think we did answer this one a little bit. Yeah, we have um, the one lion that Mark showed back at the beginning um, that moved up to Colorado. We used to, <laughs> we called him the lionfish because he used to cross the Rio Grande off all the time. So he'd go back and forth um, use the, using the land on the, the other side and then using the, the southern portion of Bandelier. Um, I'm sure he's not the only lion that does that either. So just the one that we had collared down there. Awesome. Great. So this next question is very relevant. How long did the radio collars stay on? That's a good question. So the battery life is typically, it depends on the collar, but typically between two and five years, depending on the battery that we get. Um, we try to change out the collar before the battery dies. Um, so the goal is to have that collar on for the, the span of the lion's life, um, whether it's that collar or we switch it out. But yeah, so we do have some collared lions. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, I guess M8 is a good example. We had them collared for what, five years, but we switched out the collar three times, twice. We switched out the collar twice on him, so. And for the cubs, do, do the collars fall off? The collars do not fall off. We do have, if if we want to drop the collar, we can do that. For the cubs. Oh, sorry, for the cubs? Yes. I'm sorry, I answered that wrong. Um, no, yes, the cub collars will fall off once once they get too small. So Perfect. once the cubs grow, right around nine months, the cub collars fall off. All right. Any evidence of increased mule deer abundance due to fires, which may benefit cougars, question mark? Can you say that one again? I'm sorry. Any evidence of increased mule deer abundance due to fires? Increased mule deer abundance. Okay, so just, yeah. Yeah, has their population um, increased? I don't know that we've analyzed that yet in the project. So, okay. Um, so that's part of the, the, the restoration portion of this project that we're still working on. Um, hopefully within the next few years, at least by 2025, 2026, we should have that analyzed. So not sure yet. <laughs> okay, perfect. So we have a question in the room. Right up your mouth, okay. Um, has any of your lions died yet? Yes. So we had 37 mountain lions total <laughs> colored for this project. And so that would be, <laughs> do the math here, uh, 11. 26 of the well yeah 26 of them would be dead now so either by just hunting pressures or old age or a multitude of different reasons so. hi thanks for the talk um kind of two questions do mountain lions tend to go for like one sickly elk or deer whatever they choose and um, if not, do they push those populations in the landscape, kind of like wolves do? Are you asking, sorry, do they typically go for the sick yeah, elk like or deer sick instead deer of like a healthy or, one kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, not necessarily. They will. I mean, they will because, um, how do I phrase it? Sorry. They... <laughs> Uh, let me start over. Yeah, so they don't typically go for sick uh, or aging elk or anything for any reason. Um, maybe an old old lion or a young lion, maybe we'll focus on something like that because it's easier. But lions don't have any trouble killing elk, healthy elk or, or mule deer. So I wouldn't say that they typically go for that. Um, are any of the kill sites ever shot animals? And if so, do you check, remove the lead? That's a good question. I haven't been to any that have had that have been shot, but I would assume we would remove that lead if possible. Have you had any? Okay. Yeah, so we haven't had none of our kill sites have had any shot animals. Okay, cool. Just archery. Just Great an idea. archery one. Here we go. Yeah. 
So I just wanted to understand over the length of, from 2011, you've been studying 37 different mountain lions. And right now in our area, because I live in the Jemez, we only have 11 still alive. No, we have 11 collared. We don't know oh, how oh, okay. many are there. Yeah. I, I, I was rather surprised at that number. Yeah, no, we don't. Yeah, it's hard to track populations like Mark mentioned earlier. We do have 11 collared, but other than that, yep. Um, I really like this question online. How does animal or sorry, human infrastructure such as roads and buildings affect mountain lion roaming patterns? Depends on the lion, I would say. Right. I think we've seen lions cross roads like Route 4, which is our main road out here um, pretty frequently. And then I think I've seen, we, we've seen some that, that get to it and turn around. So um, I think it just, okay, that, that's a good point. So once we analyze the resource selection model, um, that's, that'll be in there too. So we'll have a little bit more information basically just telling you what I've seen in the data. So we don't have any real analysis on that yet. Thank you. So two questions. Um, what is expected to discover with the Whiskers isotope survey? And then um, I think you had mountain lions was actually on the list of animals killed. And I'm curious about that because I imagine that might not be common, just considering predators and health concerns of predators eating their own species. Yeah, it, I wouldn't say it's common, um, but like Mark said, there's been the the four documented um, mountain lion kills on this project. Um, we also see the cubs being killed. Um, did that answer your question? <laughs> so yeah, they are. We they. I wouldn't say that mountain lions kill other mountain lions um, often as a prey source or anything. So, yeah. And I'm sorry, I forgot your first question. The isotopes. So with the whiskers, honestly, I don't know a lot about this project. It's a project that UNM is doing. Um, what I know is they can kind of track the movement of the lion throughout its, as it ages and kind of in uh, food selection. Um, so it can, it can use the whisker because the whisker grows as the lion ages. Um, so it can use it, they can use it, sorry, to um, figure out what the lion was eating throughout his life, like starting as a young one, working towards the end of its life. So it's pretty interesting. We're really interested to get data from that project. Awesome, that answered two other questions. Okay. Oh, sweet. <laughs> um, okay, so Mountain Lion Mondays, this person really misses them. Uh, will those, why, why were, were those ended and will they be started again? I've never heard of them. So <laughs> mountain lion Monday. Do you want to know. answer that one? Yeah, let's switch. I'm going to hand this over to Mark so he can answer this question. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know about mountain lion Mondays. It, it sounds like a fun day though. All right. That was a great question about mountain lion Mondays. Uh, Mount Lion Mondays, for those that aren't aware, was a social media public education activity that we had tried to um, introduce at the Valles Caldera National Preserve. One of the concerns that arise out of that was sharing active information or photos that revealed a little bit too much about place-based um, mountain lion behavior. And Another partner project that we were affiliated with in another location in New Mexico um, had some pretty negative ramifications by sharing information on social media. And so we delayed Mount Lion Mondays and additional public information. And what we're hoping to do is as the project comes towards the end of data collection, really ramping up the interpretive and public education component of the project so we're not sharing necessarily real life, real time movement data, um, but we're still getting the information out to the public. So yes, we will be starting something similar to Mount Lion Mondays, um, particularly once the Research Learning Center website is created, um, but it will be slightly different than it was done before. Thank you. How do you pick um, the whisker off? 
how do I pick the whisker off? That's a great question. So what we try to do is when the mountain lion is completely asleep, we take a small pair of scissors close to its skin, but not on its skin. And then we just clip it off while it's still asleep and it doesn't feel anything. So thank you for the question. Um, how do you like, have you ever petted a um, cub or a mountain lion? Yes, as much as I possibly can. Um, so when we're doing the capture, it's really busy and we have a lot going on. But after we've collected the data, which usually takes us about 30 to 40 minutes of photographs and measurements, we need to leave the mountain lion on the site for the drug to completely move through its body. And so that gives us a little bit of time to take some of the photos that we use for the presentations and look at the hair and the skin and the claws and stuff like that. So that's really our chance to touch it and feel it and see what it feels like. Thank you. So this question is actually about the drugs themselves. Um, what chemicals are in the immobilization drugs? Um, we're using a combination of ketamine metatomidine, um, which is a muscle immobilizer uh, disassociative so that the mountain lion doesn't remember what's going on at that moment. And also a sedative relaxant um, to calm the mountain lion down um, and relieve any stress during the capture event. So the combination of those two pharmaceuticals allows the mountain lion to reach a level of immobilization to allow us to process safely. After about 55 to 60 minutes, the ketamine will be metabolized through the body. And then we're re reversing um, that drug from that point on. And for that, we're using the adipamazole. You talked about the female bringing the cubs at three months old to the kill site to feed. Does the female ever bring part of the kill to the den? I have observed that on two occasions. Um, so often to extrapolate a little bit more, what will happen is you'll have a birth den where the cubs are born. They'll be moved to secondary dens um, as they age. Um, they'll move from den to den and the mom will move them until they can move on their own. Once they get to ballpark figure here, probably close to two months old, um, that's when I've documented on a couple of occasions, small prey animals um, being brought back to the den. It's not a common behavior, um, but the one that comes to mind right now is a Merriam's turkey um, that the female killed at one location and took it back to the den. And then the cubs were, I saw uh, evidence of feeding at that den site. The mom did not leave those cubs at that den after that feeding event took place and then moved them to another location immediately afterwards probably to reduce the smell and other things that could create vulnerability for those cubs. So it's not very common, but I have observed it. Okay, so two questions. Um, how often do you change batteries and have you found any reasons based on camera footage of den failures in the HEMIS? The first part of that question was change batteries. Um, I'm not sure if that's changed batteries on the cameras or changed batteries on the collars. But um, second part of the question is cameras. So I'm gonna go with that. Um, depending on the camera and the batteries, some of the trail cameras I have out right now will last a full year without changing batteries. Um, that's not super typical, but for trail monitoring, sometimes that can occur if it's not a really busy site. For the den sites, it's, fairly quick um, because they do move the cubs to secondary dens. The cameras aren't staying up at that den for too long, um, maybe a week or two probably before the female decides to move the cubs to a different location. And if the cameras are on battery mode, um, they're filling up probably within about 10 days to, to, to two weeks um, at that point. So hopefully that answers the question of whatever they were getting at with that. But they follow up with me if they have additional questions on cameras and den monitoring. Oh, there was a, sorry, 
failed den question. Have we identified reasons for failed den? Thank you. Um, the most common uh, failed den reason up here so far has been male mountain lions. Um, and yeah, I, I went into that a little bit, but we've seen that pretty frequently. We did have one cub or sorry, one den that was lost to black bears as well. So. Oh, my bad. Oh. <laughs> this is a really good talk. Thank you. Um, I have two brief questions. The first one is how soft are the mountain lions? Mm -hmm. I know you talked about their fur, but I, I want to know how soft they actually are. And then also, are the cubs awake or asleep when you collar them? Great questions. Um, mountain lions, the adults, I don't personally feel like are very soft. Um, they're just corded muscle um so they're pretty thick furred um we have a couple of other people in the room that have touched mountain lions so maybe they'll disagree with me the cubs however are a much softer fur um it hasn't changed to that hard fur yet um the cubs we do not sedate at all um, during the handling or collaring process um, at that three to four week old time frame, we're able to pick them up, put a radio collar on there, and we are really, really trying hard to minimize the amount of time we're at that site. So it's putting the collar on, sometimes it's ear tagging, um, and then putting the cubs right back into the den. And it's been a huge relief for me to put the cameras up afterwards and identify that there is not an adverse effect to those cubs from our behavior. The females are coming right back in picking the cubs up, licking them, cleaning them, not leaving right away and actually staying there at the den with the cubs. Um, so it's been working out really well and we would not try to sedate um, a small animal like that at all. So we can do it all physical restraint. Oh, we get to replay the video. Yeah, so that is exact. yeah, that's right after we captured them um, and put those collars on and the female came back in. So it worked out really well. Um, so if someone is hiking in the Valles Caldera, what is their likelihood of encountering a lion or a bear? Very low, low likelihood of encountering a mountain lion at the Valles Caldera. Um, depending on where the person was hiking and what time of day or evening, um, there's a decent chance of encountering a black bear. Um, there's a much higher black bear density in the Hamas Mountains in general and the Valles Caldera. And the black bears will use a much broader range of environments. So um, grasslands, old logging roads, more exposed into open areas that people are more likely to frequent. Um, so their chances of encountering a black bear are higher. Uh, mountain lions are very secretive, don't like to be seen. They see us coming a long time before we see them. So it's a pretty low likelihood they would encounter a mountain lion. How do you play with a mountain lion? How do we play with the mountain lion? So we try not to. Um, we, we do an adult version of playing with the mountain lion, I guess would be the best way that I can describe it. So we try very hard to respect them because they are a pretty magnificent animal and they have a lot of charisma and power to them. And so we gather the information that we need to answer the questions that are very important, um, but we try not to go above and beyond that um, to the range that would normally be discussed as plain. Um, however, getting into the field of science allows you to follow them and learn about them and learn their natural behaviors without being influenced by us as much as possible. And to me, that feels a lot like playing with mountain lions. Um, following their tracks and following their collar data, seeing what they do out there um, can be pretty powerful and can feel a lot like playing. So I would say grow up to become a biologist and you get to do your own version of playing with mountain lions. Great advice. That was a great question. It was a great question. Um, okay, so what is the relative density of mountain lions compared to black bears? I've seen many bears, but no mountain lions. And this is probably 
going back to what you were saying is they just tend to stay very stealthy, right? It's a combination. So mountain lion density appears, I think going back to that number was 1.1 mountain lions per hundred square kilometers. Um, I believe the black bear estimates right now are 17 black bears per hundred square kilometers. Um, that's based on New Mexico Department of Game and Fish numbers. Um, so I apologize if I'm misciting that, but um, the general answer is there's a much higher density. Behavior is much different between the two species. Habitat use is much different between the two species. Um, so the bears are more active during the day as well as in the evening. And so all of those will factor in on why that individual probably saw bears more than mountain lions. Got it. Um, why is top predator hunting still allowed? That's a question that I'm not going to get into in today's talk. Um, I'd be happy to discuss it outside of this venue with this individual if they want to contact me directly. Um, we aren't the game commission or anything else. So um, I don't feel like I'm in a position to answer that. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. How is um, playing with a cub very hard? How is it very hard? Yeah. Um, it's difficult because we care about them and we want them to be safe. Um, and it's difficult because we're never quite sure when mom's going to come back. And so we have to be quick and we have to be safe. And both of those things make it difficult sometimes uh, to work with the young ones. You have a lot of good questions. She does. Does anyone else that's waiting in this line right here want to ask a question or are you just chilling? Okay, cool. Um, so we have a ton of questions and we agreed before this, we would end at 655, which we have five more minutes. So it's probably like two more questions. Is that cool? I, I'm okay with two more questions. Perfect. You can try to find two representative ones maybe that we can. Got it. Trying. And then, um, by all means, our email addresses are on the slideshow for everybody. Um, you can reach out to us because we won't get up to all the questions today, but please don't hesitate to email us. And then just remember, please be kind and patient with us because it'll take a while to get back to you. Okay. How far south from the Bias Caldera have you recorded from your collared lion. So how far have they gone? So the furthest movement we've documented on this project was the dispersal individual that went north to Colorado. Mm -hmm. The We have documented, since this project does extend down to the Southwest Hamas Mountains, um, we've actually captured individuals um, down south of Hamas Springs and down south of the town of Ponderosa. Um, those individuals have moved as far down as Santa Ana and Zia Pueblo, um, but have not reached Highway 550. So hopefully that'll make sense to whoever asked that question. And I was searching through questions. So this is a cub related question, um, but uh, I was searching through other questions that I don't know if you covered this already. The mother must know that something has been askew in her den. What is their reaction to this realization? Do they react at all? Yeah, so that kind of goes back to what I was saying just a moment ago about my relief. Um, early in this project, we did not do any cub captures or early den site visits. Um, unfortunately, what that was causing it was we had no birth was happening, but we wouldn't identify what was happening to the cubs because they would just go missing. So we started doing this early den site visit to just confirm cubs put a camera up in some cases in some cases we didn't even do that once we realized that it really wasn't causing much of an impact um we're able to expand that into getting radio callers on the cubs which just opens up a bunch of new questions allows us to really kind of identify what's happening in the early life of that animal what we've seen on the cameras typically was the mother will come back to the site, smell around a little bit. Um, the two cubs or the two dens that we've collared, the females went right back into the den after smelling around for only one short video. 
laid back down with the cubs and continued what we believe to be natural behavior. Um, there were a couple of occasions where the females would look at the cameras, um, but she did not knock the camera out of the way or do anything like that. Um, so it's been a very minimal response, I would say, um, to our presence at the site. And just one more question. Do they often move den sites? Yes. Um, and I don't have good data to answer this, but I will tell you anecdotally, what I have seen is it is very individual specific. I have one very high stress female that comes to mind that probably had somewhere in the ballpark of 15 to 20 dens in the first two months of the cub's life. Um, just very frequently moving from site to site. We have other females that maybe two to three dens um, over the course of the first couple of months of the cub's life. But I don't believe we've ever had a female stay at one single den the entire time. So they are moving. Um, it's just variable based on the female from what I've been able to tell. And there may be other factors that I haven't been able to record that are causing some of that. Um, but I do know the female that moved her cubs a lot was not a response to us because that is one of the den sites that I did not visit right away. I went after the female was moving the cubs. Um, so it is interesting that they just have that behavior um, and it's variable, but it always does seem to happen, at least all the females we've been following. We have so many more questions, but what I'm going to do is email them to you. <laughs> that sounds great. Awesome. Thank, thank you, you everyone everybody. for joining us this evening. And thank you too much, so much to Mark and Sarah for sharing their knowledge. Round of applause if you're on virtual or if you're in the room still. Thank you.